And Revelation literally said, blessed are the one who reads these words out loud. So we've been reading the entire book of Revelation together out loud, every sermon. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters with her. The kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittered with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of prostitutes, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimonies of Jesus or to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which was seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come out of the abyss and to go on to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose name have been written in the book of life from the creation of the world would be astonished when they see the beast because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also the seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has yet comes. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Ten horns you saw of ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as the kings along with the beasts. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb. The lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and kings of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. When the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and languages. The beasts and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority. Until God's words are fulfilled, the woman you saw, it's the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. The word of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. A little scary, as uh, same as last week. Uh, it's an exposed view, a zoom-in picture of this beast and how it infiltrates. A couple pictures you need to understand. This is just a review from last week. Babylon is representing a spiritual deterioration of all nations from God. The word Babylon appears in the Bible. It's not literal, the place of Babylon, but now has become the word that represents sin or or fallen away from God. It's a catch-all word for those who are falling away from God. Uh, A woman is the prostitute. It is not a specific person, but a great city. Uh, I know the language is a little bit graphic. You're going to have to explain the word prostitute to your children if they're sitting in church today. Um, So so the woman is a prostitute. It's not a specific person, but a great city. The beast is Satan, and it illustrates Satan, infiltrates, influence in three areas, the government, religion, and individual minds. We cover government last week. The seven heads is the seven hills of Rome. Um, ten horns, kings, and kingdoms, waters, peoples, multitude, nations, and language. This kind of sums up the entire vision of how Satan infiltrates society um, and, and where it is at the time. But remember, when, when Revelation was written, uh, it had to make sense to the people back then. So when they read the seven heads or the ten horns, they, they understood it's, it's the seven head of Rome and the church that was existing at the time. And then the way God illustrates our relationship between him and us in the Bible is like a marriage. 
And, and we are the bride, and he is the husband. And he illustrates this way. When sin enters into our lives and separates between us and God, uh, he used the word spiritual prostitution or spiritual adultery. And, and he introduced this idea to the nation of Israel back in the book of Hosea, where he called Hosea. This is all review from last week, by the way. Hosea, so I'm going a little bit fast, okay? So um, review here. Hosea chapter 1 verse 2 says, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go and marry a promiscuous woman. So a promiscuous woman at the time was the nation of Israel and now also represents us and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Remember the, the, the scripture, I say this over and over again, that it, it, was a, it wasn't written to us, but it's certainly written for us. We can see and learn this, how we need to follow the word of God, and, and we apply to ourselves just as much as the nation is of Israel. So throughout the scripture, also review, God revealed to us that Jesus was going to be the groom, to marry us back to him, to bring us back in union with God. That's how the book of Revelation works, backwards, right? So in John chapter 3, John the Baptist introduced Jesus as the groom. He says this, the bride belonged to the groomsman. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him. And in full of joy, he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. So John basically saying, I'm introducing to you the groom that's going to marry you, and now my joy is complete. And then revelation happens. Chapter 17, a, a revealing, zoom in view, exposing the details on spiritual adultery. And of course, Satan is behind the scene of it all. But how does he do it? Who does he do it with? How, how does he manifest himself, uh, and, and, and what forces does he use, or, or what kind of influence does he have in our society to destroy the work of God? I want you to pay attention to this. The pattern of the prophecy in the Scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation, okay, the pattern of the prophecy of the Antichrist, the 666, the mark of the beast, the, the, we always wonder, who's the Antichrist? Is it the Pope? Is it who? Is it, uh, you know, Joel Osteen? Or, or is it uh, the, the media? Is it the government? We, we're trying to figure out who is the Antichrist. And the pattern of the prophecy, the Antichrists are people who are mesmerized by kings and government. The beauty, health, and wealth form of worship. We worship ourselves and the success of the individuals. And we're going to explain that in a little, in a little bit. So essentially, uh, Satan attracts us or influences us or he infiltrates in these three areas is governments or kings and then religion, which essentially are worship or churches, and then individual, which is us. So last week we covered government. That whole thing was review. Now let's move on to the next part. I said this back in chapter 12. When we were introduced the dragon and Satan himself. He raised two beasts. One from where? The sea and one from the land. And Satan kind of fade back into the background, and he watches the sea beast and the land beast go to work. The sea beast was obvious, right? There was government. We covered that last week. The, the sea beast was, was obvious. The, those who are anti-Christianity, anti-church, anti-Jesus, that would be obvious. But the second beast is the one that I need to worry about more than anything. The second beast, it says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. Essentially, it looked like Jesus, but it was wolves and sheep clothing, the way Jesus described it. This is a zoom-in view how the land beast is going to infiltrate the earth or society, especially the church. So chapter, chapter 17, verse 18, I need you to pay attention. Hold on here, okay? Don't, don't, get, don't get lost because it's going to make sense to you, but if you don't pay attention, it's not going to make sense to you. In chapter, verse seven, chapter 17, verse 18, it says, The woman you saw, 
the woman that sits on the seven hills and dressed in scarlet robes and all these. It's a great city that rules over kings of the earth. And then back in chapter 11 in Revelation, I know you're like, oh, slow down, slow down. Okay, just pay attention. When they finished their witness, remember in Revelation chapter 11, they killed who? The witnesses. Those who were speaking of the name of Jesus, they rejoiced at their failure. So when they finished speaking, uh, finished their witnesses, the beast pray, uh, the prey that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them, overcame them and killed them. And leave their corpuses on the street of the great city, which is called Sodom and Egypt. Spiritually speaking, even their Lord was crucified. And why do I need to make that point to you? Because it's important. Because what is this great city? The great city, it's us. The woman is the great city. The great city is Jerusalem. Jerusalem represents us, people of God. The center of worship, city of David. A great city represents essentially you and I gathering together in worship. But we allow Satan to infiltrate our worship or religion. The great city represents us. And we have allowed Satan to infiltrate our worship, our churches, our homes, our beliefs, what we know the scripture to be true. And we allow Satan to influence a little bit of it and a little bit more and a little bit more. Keep keep in mind, this had to make sense to them. All right, I'm about to give you a very zoom in view and it might get uncomfortable. But hang on. I might get some hate hate mails after this. The woman, the great city, was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stone. And pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable, abominable things, and filth of her adultery. This had to make sense to its original readers. It's describing something. It's describing the great city, the woman, the great city, which represents the church or us. And back then, traditional interpreters would suggest this. The Catholic Church. Original interpreter would would interpret this view of this woman, the church. And there might be some truth to that. Because the only thing that exists back then was the Catholic Church, the priests, the Pope, the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, the first 20 years of Christianity. There were no denominations. There were no Baptists. There were no Methodists. uh, There were no Presbyterians and and Lutherans. That didn't happen until the 1600s. So from the time Jesus resurrected from the dead to the time of 1600, Martin Luther, there was nothing other than the Roman Catholic Church. So this language had to make sense to those people. And there were no, you know, denominations the way we know it today. But there's one church, the universal church, the word Catholic It is not the same as the way we understand Catholic Church today. The word Catholic back then means the universal church stays with me here. My point to you is that the warning is not just for the Catholic Church people or the Pope. As some of us have favored some of those interpretations, the warning is for God's people in general because it's speaking to the church at the time. The universal church. 
to keep ourselves from being influenced by Satan. And that, that, might, that might feel a little bit uncomfortable to you, to you guys, because some of you grew up with Catholic backgrounds, and you might have families that, that are in the Catholic church. And some of you who comes here because you, 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 sound, you feel like this church is okay and, 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 and some, somewhat friendly, and, and the music is good, the pastor's awesome, right? So you come, but, but you're Catholic still. You're like, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic. So this, this might be comfortable, but I want to be fair. I, I want to say this. All right? It is not fair for us just to pinpoint that this is about the Catholic Church because the language here is for the universal church, the church in general, religion in general, but specific religion, Christianity. Remember, call, false religion, it's, it's obvious. If, if it ain't Jesus, it ain't true. Right? If it's not Jesus, it's not gospel. Right? So Islam and Buddhism and all those things, you know, we know it's false, Right? But the language here, it's, it's for us, for, for the church in general. So I want to be fair, and, and some of our friends are, have Catholic backgrounds, and what I want to be fair to you. This is not just saying, oh, the Catholic church is the Antichrist, or the Catholic church is going to hell. That's not the point. The point is, the warning is for churches, religions, to be careful, to not let Satan infiltrate. Because Satan tried this on Jesus, and he failed. Matthew chapter 4. If you are the son of God, remember Satan took, took Jesus up on the mountain. He said, you're the son of God. He says, throw yourself down from here. It is when he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And again, at the end, he says, you are the son of God. Tell these stones to become bread. The way Satan tempts Jesus is the same way he tempts us today and how he infiltrates the church. Isn't God going to save you anyways? Isn't he the most powerful, loving, almighty God? Isn't he going to save you anyway? So you might as well live it up. Jesus, jump. He's going to save you. Live it up. Isn't he the God that loves you? He's going to provide for you anyways, the creator of the universe. Just tell these stones to turn into bread. Tell him to give you more. Tell him to lift you up. Tell him to do dance around you. Isn't he your God? Why isn't he doing that? So if he's not doing that to you, he must not be real. So come follow me instead. That, that's the temptation that Jesus, I mean, that Satan's trying to tempt Jesus. And the, the big word that we use is the attraction model. And I'm not knocking all the churches. I'm, that's not, I'm not knocking the Catholic church or any other church. I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm preaching from the word of God, and this is the truth. Jesus, I mean, Satan uses the attraction model to tempt Jesus. What is that attraction model? What can God do for me? What can God do for me? What can God give me? We use the name Jesus to sell merge, to get rich on. We use the name Jesus to buy airplanes. We use the name Jesus to abuse women and children. And because we're in the same denomination, so we got to sweep it under the rug and don't tell anybody until the news media pick it up. We use the name Jesus and his grace as a way to keep on sinning. You are not perfect. He loves you anyways. We know you make mistakes. So keep on sinning. No, that, that's the attraction model. That, that's the model that we want Jesus to be for us in a way where we can excuse ourselves to keep doing things because he's so big and powerful and mighty and gracious. So we're going to keep abusing that grace and privilege. And we allow Satan to infiltrate our worship or our churches. When worship becomes about us, when worship becomes about us and not about God, eventually the church will become the whisper of Satan. When worship becomes about us and not about God, eventually the church will become the whisper of Satan. You know, like sometimes we, we fall into this trap as well. That we come to church, we're hoping that God's going to fix our problems. And then when our problems fix, we go away for a while. And then we go away for a while, and then we come back to church when the problem becomes uh, a part of our lives again. And then we go back to church. We keep going back. For, we're hoping that God's going to fix our problem, but that's not how it works. 
because now you're making religion and making church worship, making going to church about you and not about God at all. We come because we, we are forever grateful and thankful that God saves our lives. Amen? That's why we come. We worship. And I don't want to rewrite anything that has been written before, but I think Paul Harvey, back in 1965, wrote something perfectly illustrates the condition of the church back then. And he says, this is going to happen. This is back in 1965. And I summarized it a little bit, took out a couple things. And he says, if I were the devil, if I were the devil, the prince of darkness, I want to engulf the world, the whole world in darkness. I have a third of its real estate and four fields of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. You. If I was the devil, I would want everything, but, but I wouldn't stop until I have the very thing, the apple of God's eyes, which is you, the church. So I set about however necessary to take over the United States, to subvert the churches first. This was preached in 1965. I would subvert the church first. I begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. The young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of other way around. I would confine that what's bad is good and what is good it's square. In the old, I would teach them to pray after me, our Father, in Washington and his own churches. I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbols of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. In other words, if I were the devil, i just keep on doing what I'm doing. Good day. <laughs> I don't want to rewrite that. But those words illustrate perfectly how Satan would infiltrate religion, the church. The, the Antichrist is obvious. Those who will say Jesus is not true. Those are obvious. What I worry more about is the land beast where it sounds like Jesus or it looks like Jesus, but it sounds like Satan. So James has this, has this line to, to the church he was ministering to. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 23, he says this, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. The problem is that Satan has convinced the church to twist and reinterpret God's word to fit our own preference and agendas and lifestyle. We come to church, we want to hear something inspiring, we want to hear something funny, we want to, we want to walk away from here feeling good and how to plan our days. Uh, but I, I present to you, not every Sunday is that way. We do have some Sundays like that. But the church, it's also a place of conviction and correction. The church is not just a place of motivation and inspiration, but the church is, is a place of conviction and correction where it tells you where your shortcomings are and how you can please God and worship God and therefore, we need to start taking God's word seriously. I mean, really take God's word seriously. I had lunch with someone this week, and they asked me, what if someone disagree with you on your sermons? What do you do? How do you explain it? So I said, it's simple. There is biblical interpretation where you can take the Bible, you can read it, and you form your own opinion and say, oh, that's what I think. 
Or there's biblical interpretation, but inspirational biblical interpretation. Can you back up what you're saying with the Word of God? That's inspirational biblical interpretation. So therefore, I can listen to your opinion on what the Bible say, but I submit to inspirational biblical interpretation where I submit to literally what the Word of God say. It doesn't matter what your opinion are. God doesn't care about your opinion. God cares about your inspirational biblical knowledge and his word. So I said, you, you, can't, you, you can't really follow God and teach God or worship God if you don't know his words. This is his words to you. That's why we have so many opinions about God's word, because not many people read this and know it and learn it and follow it. So we have a ton of opinions on how God's word is supposed to be, but that, that's opinion. Inspirational biblical interpretation is taking God's word and I submit to it. Sometimes I don't like it. Sometimes I disagree with it. But if I can back it up with the Bible, then I have to submit to it because that's God's word. So it's time that we take God's word seriously. And my challenge to you is do, do we teach them to our children? Do, do we make efforts to, to get them involved in Bible studies or going to church or you yourself going to church? as much as extra activities and curriculums? Do we make efforts to bring them to church so they, they can grow, so when they grow up, they make the same efforts with their spouse and their children? The warning of Revelation is not about everyone else, kind of like how our Christian community would sit back and say, yeah, Revelation is going to judge you, and you're going to hell, and, and the, God's going to condemn you. No, the book of Revelation is for us, for Christians. The way the book opens up, it says, to the churches. It wasn't written to Joe Schmo down the street that's mowing his grass today. It was written to the church in Ephesus. It was written to the church in Smyrna, to the church in Pergamon, to the church in Thyatira, to the church in Sardis, to the church in Philadelphia, to the church in Laodicea. And in the middle of these churches, it's spiritual adulterous to the church of Thyatira. And, and I speak this from the heart. And if I offend you, I care, but I want you to know it's from the heart. I care if it does offend you, but I want you to know it's from the word. We live in a culture where we are afraid to hurt people's feelings, right? Uh, with truth. We're afraid to mention uh, denominations, how some have fallen so far away from God. we're afraid to hurt their feelings or we're afraid that we're, we'll be out of the popular groups. The scripture is truth and we have to yield to it. It's God's word to us. We can't follow, explain, or worship God if we don't know his words. The challenge for us to grow and, and you all wonder, um, who's the Antichrist? What does he look like? Who, who is his biggest advocate? Who does he use? Who does Satan use? And sometimes I can't help it. You're looking right at him. James says, anyone who listens to the word of God but does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks at himself in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. As the band come forward, I want to challenge you this. I sat in Kentucky. Who lives in Kentucky? I don't know why people live in Kentucky. But I was there this summer in June, July. No, I'm just kidding. It's a great, great place. I, I was in Louisville, Kentucky. I was going to meet with Kyle but, and Brian Seitz, Caden's dad. But it, didn't, it didn't work out. Anyways, I, I sat in Kentucky, and I sat in the front porch, and I just start to think, and I think about you, and I think about our church, 
and I think about what am I preaching and, and do I really follow what I'm teaching and preaching? And, and it dawned on me that, that I was busy. My, my life was so busy. And something has to go. So I made, I made a list of things in my life. What's, what's most important what's not important? The most important thing is, is my sons and, and my wife and my family. Of course, God is always the number one. But what's most important is my, my sons, my family, uh, my wife, and, and, and home. Right? A healthy church is a healthy family, and a healthy family is a healthy church. So I want to keep that in mind always. And then the second most important thing in my life right now is, is you. It's is our church, Connect the Life Christian Church. And, and then basketball. But there are two components to basketball. There's, there's my high school season and there's my travel season, which covers the whole year. And wisdom says you can, you can only do three things really well in life. And I have a list of other things you can do. But you all know this, right? You can only do three things really well in life. So I had to make the hard decision that something had to go. So I left Liz and the kids. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no. So I called the school. And you guys know how much I love basketball. I called the school and I said, no, I won't be coaching this year. And that was hard. I had a 6'3 girl just pay full tuition to come just to play for me. You know, I had a girl just register, left her old school, came just to play for me. But you have to make the tough decisions. And some of those decisions is, is it's just a whisper of Satan says, stay busy. You're doing great. You're doing great. Look how busy you are. Look how much you're providing for your family. Look how much you're working. Look, look how admirable you are to your coworkers. You're doing great. And you know, on Sunday, sleep in. You worked hard all week. Your church don't need you. There's another 140 people out there today. They don't need you. You're doing great. So I had to make that decision for myself to let something go and to focus on what God calls you to do. And sometimes in life, you look at the mirror and you say, what, what's wrong? Why isn't my life the way God wants me to be? Because we allow the scripture to be twisted and turned and we walk away from it and forget what we just read and we pretend like life is it's okay and everything's fine, but it's not. And I would say, why isn't the church stronger? Why isn't the church make more advance in the society? Because we have people who don't know the word of God. We have people who rather invest in something else other than the gospel. We, are, we have people who rather spend time elsewhere than the church and his church and God's church. We have people who rather spend more time at work than with their own families so their sons and their daughters and their wives can say that's the father that follows Jesus or that's the mother that follows Jesus. College students, it's so easy to sleep in on Sunday, isn't it, with your friends in the dorms? Young people, it's so easy, isn't it? Say, so let me skip that, you know. I went last week. And all of a sudden, Satan whispers in your ears and say, see, it's not that bad, is it? You're okay. So the church becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And Satan becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And we look in the mirror one day and say, what happened? What happened is you missed today's sermon. That's what happened. You missed God's word. You missed church. 